Um, so this is what uh, a typical galaxy looks like in real life. This is a Hubble observation. Um, and again, here are those basic characteristics I, I was showing you. If it's thin and axisymmetric, you can only see one of those here, but it's axisymmetric, just trust me it's thin. Um, and that it's rotating, you have to trust me on that as well. Um, here's a census of the local universe. Um, what I'm plotting here is on the vertical axis is the oxygen abundance. So this is the relative number of oxygen atoms to hydrogen atoms, and we're going to use this as a proxy for the metallicity. On the x-axis is the distance from the center. This is, these are observations from the Monda survey. Um, each line here is a different mass. Um, and what I want you to notice is that above, for most masses, above about 10 to the 9, so above about the mass of the SMC, um, the, the oxygen abundance tends to rise toward the center. These things are more metal rich in their centers than they are in their outskirts. So these are, these are the characteristics that I'm going to draw back on throughout this talk. Rotation support, more metal rich in its centers than they are in their outskirts. And so the majority of star forming galaxies today um, are disks above about the mass of the LMC. Um, star forming is, is, the, is the key word there. Um, uh, and so it's really important to understand when galaxies develop disk like structure. And I'll show you in a second that it's a, it's a nice discriminant between. Um, galaxy formation models. Um, and so we want to time the formation of disks and galaxies. And so to do that, here's where I dutifully show uh, a figure from my host, <laughs> says, a figure that Casey made from the, the, the Campbell's uh, survey. And so what Casey and company are plotting here um, in, in three panels, on the x-axis is running redshift, so longer ago, nearer to the present day. Um, and each of these postage stamps is a random galaxy of the mass that we think the Milky Way mass, the, Milky, the, the mass of the Milky Way at these particular time stamps. So this is a movie of the Milky Way growing up. Okay? And so today, or about two, two and a half billion years ago, that's the left edge of this top panel here, you see most Milky Way mass galaxies have disks. As we go back in time, galaxies are getting smaller. They're getting more irregular. They're getting bluer. That's the vertical axis on these plots, um, which indicates that they're, they're forming stars more rapidly. Right? And so the question I want to ask is, at what point along this sequence um, does, do these galaxies, in particular, this is for, for Milky Way mass galaxy, but as a function of mass, at what point along these sequence do galaxies form ordered, long-lived, disk-like structure, as we saw in the, in the title movie? Um, so I'll take a step back real quick. This is a, a cartoon of our classic understanding of galaxy formation. So in the early universe, um, dark matter halos and, the, and the, the kind of hot gas inside the, the halos are thought to have acquired angular momentum through tidal torques with kind of the cosmological mass structure of the universe. Uh, with time, the uh, gas being collisional can collide and cool. And so it's going gonna, it's gonna, to uh, radiate away, shock heat and radiate away a lot of its orbital energy, but it conserves its angular momentum. And so what that does is it cools, and that cold gas is going to sink to the center of the potential well. And relatively quickly, about a, a few a 10 to the 8 years, a thin gas disk should form in the centers of these potential wells. And so this story kind of is supported by uh, a few by observations of disks in the local universe, their angular momentum, their sizes. Um, if you look at disks in the local universe, they all tend to have thin gas disks and thin young stellar disks. Those are presumably stars that just formed out of the thin young disk. In this picture, the, thick, the thicker, older stellar disks are stars that were at one point formed in these thin gas disks and then were just dynamically heated uh, through time. Um, but this picture is missing a lot of the, oh, I should back up. So this picture predicts that thin gas disks are kind of a staple of galaxy formation. That is to say that we should see thin gas disks in galaxies at all times. Right? But this picture is missing a lot of the elements that we now know are important um, 
for uh, a galaxy formation. This, here's the laundry list here. Um, these include a lot of elements that inject random energy into the system and random angular momentum into the system, and that these, these elements act on relatively fast time scales, right? So you have stellar and agent feedback, which can blow gas out of galaxies, metal rich gas out of galaxies. Galaxy galaxy mergers, which can destroy existing structure, um, just re accretion of, of that, that outflowing gas. You get, you get gas from the, the IGM that knows nothing about the initial torques that the halo felt and is just coming in with its own uh, angular momentum. And then you have internal kind of instabilities in the disk that are, uh, will uh, move, move mass around. Um, and so to, to illustrate this picture, I'm going to rewind the clock on that movie that I showed you from the title slide where we had a nice isolated. I'm not going to say boring, but it was like a it was it was a relatively boring uh, galaxy that was just going about its way rotating. So this is the formation history of that galaxy. So on the left, I'm showing you the gas density, and on the right, I'm showing you the gas metallicity. And what I want you to take away from this is kind of the the, the really disordered mode of accretion um, uh, in the early formation history of this galaxy. And so what this does is it tends to rearrange the angular momentum, both the scale and also the direction of the angular momentum of this disk relatively rapidly. It tends to destroy the existing gaseous rotating uh, structure. If we look on the right panel, the gas metallicity um, outflows from the, uh, the, the there, there's a huge one right there, outflows um, that are induced by uh, a star formation feedback tend to redistribute metals out of the ISM and into the, the CGM. Those metals will eventually cool back onto the central galaxy. With time, as the kind of universe calms down, the star formation activity calms down, the accretion onto this galaxy calms down, this thing has the chance to form a long-lived, well-ordered rotating disk with those same characteristics that we opened the talk with. That it's rotating, and that it tends to be more metal-rich in its centers, and is in its outskirts. And so I just painted you two very different models. One in which the accretion of the galaxies is relatively calm and orderly, and we should expect a large fraction of disks at all times. Uh, in the second model, disk formation is kind of a it's kind of a uh, a, a fleeting phenomenon or whatever, right? The disk, disks are constantly being formed and destroyed, and formed and destroyed. And so we should not see a large fraction of disks necessarily in the early universe. Right? So the discriminating question between these two cartoons is, are disk galaxies in place in the early universe? Um, so this is going to be the question that we're going to ask um, throughout this talk. Um, and so to do that, I'm going to probe it from two independent angles. We're going to measure the, 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 the kinematics of galaxies, the rotation of velocity dispersion, uh, looking back to the origin of two. And then we're going to look at the metallicity gradient. So these are probing those, each, each set of those characteristics that, that I was talking about. Um, well, all of this work was done with a large set of collaborators, some of, some of whom are at um, AM, including Casey, who, who PI the, the survey for the metallicity gradient work. Uh, so we'll start with the kinematics. Um, so very briefly, the sample here that uh, I'm drawing on is from this Sigma survey. So we have about 50 star-forming galaxies that lie along what is known as the star formation main sequence. So I'm plotting here the star formation rate versus the stellar mass. The background gray points are ran a random sample of, of galaxies. The foreground points are the, are the, is the sample that I'm going to be using. So these are sampling the, 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 the normal distribution of galaxies. Um, of star forming galaxies at these ratios. Uh, so we're using MOS fires with spectroscopy. I'll show you how, how, how we measure uh, kinematics in a second. We have ancillary um, Hubble imaging, and we're measuring kinematics from the ionized from ionized uh, gas using the HOP and the free emission lines. Um, so for context, what I'm plotting here is the cosmic star formation rate density. So the number of stars that are forming in a given volume in the universe is a function of look back time. So if you prefer look back time, it's here, but here's redshift. So this is known to rise and peak at about a redshift of two and then decline again. And so 
the survey is, really, is sampling right around this peak, which is a really important epoch for the stellar mass growth of galaxies and the structural assembly of galaxies. Um, so very quickly, how, how do we measure kinematics? So in the left panel, I'm showing you a Hubble color image. So on top of that is a slit from a uh, fire. And along that slit, each position along this galaxy, we get the, um, we get, uh, we measure uh, its spectrum. Um, and so this thing is, this galaxy is rotating, and the, the way you can tell that is that this side of the galaxy is uh, blue shifted, and this side of the galaxy is red shifted. And so what we do is we fit a rotation curve model to the, to the spectrum, and we take the width at a given position, and we fit a velocity dispersion profile. Right, so here is one that is strongly rotating. Here is a system that is not strongly rotating. You can see that the width of the, the, the emission lines are not like, competitive with the, the tilt of the, the rotation. So this is something that we would say is more dispersion dominated. This is more rotation dominated. So the two quantities that uh, I'll discuss are um, the V-rot, which is the rotational uh, velocity, and the gas velocity dispersion. And so just as an asterisk, the, the, the gas velocity dispersion here, which we we'll call disorder motions, is integrating all the random motions below the steam limit. Um, so that includes relative motions between each two regions, the internal turbulence in each two regions, and the, the, the thermal broadening of the, the ionized gas. Um, but what it does do is it subtracts off the rotational motions. So these are two independent quantities. Okay, so for reference, local Milky Way mass galaxies today have rate, ratios of rotation velocity to velocity dispersion of about 10 to 15. So we'll keep that in the back of our mind. Uh, so let me set up this plot. So what I'm plotting here is the rotation velocity versus the stellar mass. Uh, in the local universe, if you plot disks on this relation, it's known as the, the Tully-Fish relation, and it's incredibly tight with a very small scatter. More massive things are rotating faster. Great. This is what it looks like at redshift 2 from our measurements. Um, so there are a few things I want you to take away. The high mass galaxies here are rotating. They're actually rotating faster than Tully-Fisher. There's a, a reason for that, and that's that the we're missing a we're missing a, a, a term here, which is the gas mass. So that's there's some there's some dynamical support that we're not necessarily accounting for. But that's that's not really the interesting part. The interesting part is down here at low masses. So this is 10 to the 10 and below, probably 10 to the 9 and a half, 10 to the 10. You see a lot of these systems that are not rotating as fast as we would expect disk galaxies in the local universe to rotate at those masses. And this is about the mass that we expect the the, the Milky Way to get at these masses at this redshift. So the other, the other term here is the gas velocity dispersion. So those are those disordered motions. In gray, I'm plotting where redshift zero disks lies. They, they tend to have gas velocity dispersions of about 20 kilometers per second in ionized gas. At redshift two, the gas velocity dispersions are about a factor of three higher, right? 60 kilometers per second. So this is six times the, um, the supersonic velocity of this gas. So it's incredibly high velocity dispersions that we're measuring in these galaxies. And so when we come back to this Tully-Fisher relation, and now we color code by the ratio of rotation velocity to velocity dispersion, so in yellow are things that are very, very strongly rotating. In blue are things that are very, very strongly dispersion supported. And we remember that number I told you to remember, the V over sigma greater than 10. We only find three out of 49 galaxies in our sample that are rotating with the same rotational support as we find for Milky Way mass things today. And a lot of these things that fell short of the Tully-Fisher relation are uh, dispersion supported. So dispersion support is common in these low mass galaxies. Whereas in the local universe, most of these things would be rotating and they would be on the, the Tully-Fisher relation. Um, so, so the next thing we could do is combine that survey, redshift two, with a lower redshift sample from D2 and now we're covering a very large fraction of cosmic time here, about 11, 11 billion years in cosmic time. Um, and we could track that velocity dispersion term. So these are the disordered motions. I showed you that they're about 60 kilometers per second <clears throat> at redshift two. The background points here are individual measurements. The foreground points are then with uncertainties. 
Um, with time, the, the, here, we're, we're showing two mass spins here. Red is high mass, blue is low mass. With time, both populations tend to dramatically decline in the gas velocity dispersions. So the disordered motions in these systems are, 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 uh, are, are dropping with time. And the really interesting thing is that they, it does not seem to depend on stellar mass, right? So the time is the main factor here. So the fact that it does not depend on stellar mass means that in these low mass galaxies where they have lower total dynamical support, if we now normalize by their total dynamical mass, which is quantified by this S a half parameter, so now this is the disordered motions in, in, in a galaxy normalized by its, its uh, total dynamical support, um, we see that these two populations now separate, and that these, the low mass galaxies at redshift 2-ish are dominated by disordered motions. But even the high mass population has a significant fraction of its total motions that um, are coming from disordered motions. With time, the, 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 the contribution of disordered motions to the total support is declining for both populations. Um, but at early times, low mass galaxies are dominated by disordered motions. Uh, so this is the question that I said that we were gonna, we were gonna focus on in this talk, are disk galaxies in place in the early universe? So to answer that, I'm not gonna plot the fraction of galaxies that have V-road over sigma greater than one. This is such a, a very lenient criteria to call something a disk. So this is saying that its rotation velocity is equal or greater than its velocity dispersion. And so we're gonna plot that fraction versus time in three mass spins, red, black, and blue, from low mass, from high mass to low mass. With time, or going back in time, a smaller and smaller fraction of galaxies meet this this lenient criteria. At any fixed time, the high mass population has a larger fraction of its galaxies that are meeting this criteria. So we could say that this criteria is for rotationally supported. Right? So, so with time, more and more galaxies are becoming disks, or at least meeting this criteria. Right? And so this is this is kind of a huge industry. And so a lot of folks have, have gone out and, uh, and measured this. And so what I'm plotting here is other surveys color coded by their mass, just to show that everyone is in general agreement here. Right? So, a redshift to only 50% of galaxies, 50 to 6, 70% of galaxies, are rotating. Right? But the, the question is um, when do disks develop? Right? And so, if we looked at the, the lowest mass disk in the local universe with the lowest level of rotation support, most disks of about the mass of the large Magellanic cloud have a V over sigma of about three. So let's let's bump that criteria up. Let's enforce a, a stricter criteria. And we make that same plot, the same general demographic trends pop out, and this become less and less common as you go back in time. But out here at Redshift 2, less than 30% of all galaxies meet this criteria, which is still fairly lenient, but it's more, more strict than the other one. Um, so at some level, it becomes a semantic question. When do disks form, or what do you call a disk? Right? So I'm going to say that, that a disk is the least disky thing that we have in the local universe. And even then, 30% of galaxies at um, redshift. Um, OK, so this, is, this ends part one of three of this talk. So the, 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 kin, the, the, the kinematics are telling us that a small fraction of galaxies are strongly rotating at these redshifts. So part two, I'm, I'm going to come back to this plot again. This is a fraction of the galaxies that are rotating versus redshift. Everyone's in agreement. Everyone says that about 50, 60, 70% of these things are rotating. Um, but here is a very scary set of figures. On the top is, the, is data that is at the resolution of most of the surveys on this plot. Um, what we find, if you look at the velocity map of this thing, red is moving towards you relatively, blue is moving away from you. You would think that this thing is rotating because it has a, a velocity field that looks like it's rotating. But if you reobserve this thing at a higher resolution with adaptive optics and, uh, and uh, uh, aided by gravitational lensing, so this is actually a, 
they took this great data and they, they kind of uh, made it worse, right? So this thing actually has that optics and gravitational lensing. Um, you see that there's actually two galaxies who are merging, and their the relative orbital motion there looks like the rotation of a disk. Right, so, so this is a this is a possibly a large contaminant for for you know trying to address this question um, how many galaxies are this, and so we we aimed at at answering this question or at trying to address this contaminant because this is this is a potentially large problem if we're trying to actually identify this at high redshift from kinematics. So is it safe to assume the velocity gradients observed in high redshift galaxies trace the rotational motions of this? So to do this, we took a suite of high resolution simulations. Here's one of those simulations, one snapshot of one of those simulations. We're sweeping around that simulation here just to, to, to show kind of the, the particle structure in the simulations. So There's a simulated disk at Redshift 2, but it also has this little thing here. You see this thing that's uh, falling in? Actually, there's a couple of them. So what we do is we take that simulation data and we run it through a radiative transfer code to get a noiseless image and a noiseless velocity map for 20 camera angles around that galaxy. And then we degrade those to the resolution of Hubble and the sensitivity of, of Hubble and the resolution of a spectrograph on the ground. This is a camo, so I'm going to the LT. Um, and uh, yeah, so we repixelize it, we put it at a redshift of two, we, we, uh, we add surface brightness dimming, um, all the works. Let me just, I'll just highlight that synthetic Hubble and James Webb images are available on this website if you want to play around with the simulation for you. Uh, so what did we learn? On the left here, I'm showing you three simulations where we know, based on the, the motions of its particles, that they're disks. We know that they're disks. We have the orbits of, of every particle in the simulation. We know that they're disks. Um, and if we apply the observational disk criteria, which is this laundry list of things, to these, um, to these simulations, first we look at the velocity maps and we say, yes, it has a continuous velocity gradient. Yes, it's rotating. Uh, yes, the velocity gradient is coincident with the peak and the sigma mass. It's, it's very like obtuse things. And then we look at the Hubble imaging and we say, yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes, yes, yes. And then we plot. Then I, then I show things that we know do not have disks, but we know have, are mergers. And we ask the same exact question. Yes, 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 go through the laundry list. A, a lot of those criteria are actually satisfied in the merging sample as well. So this is just going back to that to the, the scary figure I showed from real observations, we're now we're reproducing this in the in the, the simulations. That there's this smooth velocity gradient, peak and sigma right in the middle, smooth velocity gradient, peak and sigma. Right? It's not going to bring it that matches the other criteria as well, like the kinematic center line. Yeah, the that's right. Center, right. Yeah, so that's that's actually what this plot is right oh. here. So I'm just going to look at the first three of these criteria. One, two, three, that just care about the kinematic data. And I'm going to plot, I said I had 20 camera sight lines around each of these simulations. I'm going to plot the fraction of those sight lines that meet the observational disk criteria. Every single point on this plot is a merger without a disk. Everything, no, nothing here should be above zero. This is the average angular separation of those mergers. So ideally, they would all be here at zero. They're not, right? They scatter up and down, depending on your sight line to the to, to the, the merger and the, or the orientation of the merger. You could go from being confused in 0% of your sight lines to 100% of your sight lines. And this only weakly depends on the separation of the two galaxies. Um, if you add in criteria 4 or 5, which includes the high resolution Hubble imaging, it does help, but again, none, none of these are at zero, right? So what this is saying is if you have an observation, if you have a kinematic and Hubble imaging of a, of a galaxy and you really want to call it a disk because it, it checks off all of your, your disk criteria, you can never be certain. You can never be certain that you're actually seeing a disk and not a merger, right? Even with all five criteria, this thing never actually bottoms out at zero. So 
The take home is mergers masquerade as disk and low resolution kinematic data. Now the question is, how large a contaminant is this for our uh, demographic trends? And so what I'm plotting here is the, so what we do is we take these probabilities and we fold in the expected merger rate and the, the pair fraction at these red shifts. And so what I'm plotting here is now the, as a function of the observed disfraction, so those points on, on, on that plot, what is the ratio of the true disfraction to the observed disfraction um, for two mass spins? And so I will simplify this plot by just showing you where we, the, the fractions that we are actually observing. So it's about 50 to 70%. And so the correction factor up here is kind of small, right? We're not down here, we haven't fallen off this cliff yet, right? This would be bad if we were like over here. So given the fraction of galaxies that we observe as disk, given how many times we think we're going to be confused by a given merger and given how many mergers there are, we're, we estimate that this is actually a small correction to the total, the total fraction at redshift 2. Right? So you can't trust that you're ever actually seeing a disk with, with these data. But in the, in the a statistical sense, you can trust that your the contamination is relatively good. So that's a redshift two. That would break it down. You're saying the number of disk galaxies. It would break it down. Correct for mergers. That's correct. Yeah. What is it to the merger? Rate? I'm sorry. That's a question I'll ask you later. What would it do to the merger rate? Then? Because you suddenly said. A, so these a are fraction of things that you would not classify as merger, but now classify. Yeah. Yeah. Merger. It depends on. So most people don't don't actually use these methods to to distinguish mergers and to actually actually get the merger rates. Like most of them, it's like the pair fractions. But the the merger rates that I'm, that I'm using are from illustrious. <coughs> so if we trust lambda C, then these should be relatively um, right. safe. But I don't think that they would affect the inferred merger rates from the observations because it's a, they they use different techniques. What they call the symphony stuff. They claim it's one third, one third, one third. And I would say, well, yeah, percent of things you're calling discs are actually mergers. So the the symphony stuff, which is a, a smaller sample, but it's um, yeah. uh, it's high resolution, so they do have adaptive optics. Right. And with that higher resolution and the, the deeper data, you can you can start using like the curves in the in the velocity map. Um, that breaks down at some point, but you, you only have a very small handful of data that you could do that with. Symphony is, is one is one such example. Okay, so this is HST imaging with That's ground based. The ground based, and so most of the most of the, the surveys where you have like you know hundreds of galaxies yeah. are, are using uh, the same one. Okay. What fraction of disks do you use for information? Yeah, just like they're kind of away, so you can't do yeah, so you, you throw those out of the, the, the statistics yeah. immediately and... Um, and you presumably know what... Yeah. So it's actually a small... If you, if you like... If you think like a, the, the geometry of it, it's actually a small probability that you would get... Um, that you would get something that's relatively face-on because there's more solid angle on the, the edge of it. So to answer your question, I... Uh, I forgot what that fraction is. It's probably like 10, 10 or 15 percent, but you just call those like unusable data. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So the 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 sky is not falling at redshift two for this problem, right? Is the takeaway here? But the sky is likely to be falling when we try to push these measurements out to higher and higher redshift. Um, so this is another scary plot. So this is the galaxy major merger rate as derived from the lustrous for. Um, for three mass spins, so don't worry about that. Just worry about the fact that they're all increasing with increasing look back time. Galaxies are are more rapidly merging with other galaxies early in the universe, is what this plot is saying. And it's it's quite rapid. There's a factor of two increase in the in the merger rate from redshift two to three alone. In a, in another factor of two, if you go from three to four and a half. And so if you're thinking about the next frontier of measuring gas kinematics to redshift six, eight, you know, the dawn of galaxy structure and, and all those good things, um, you want to answer questions like, if we look at the rotation velocity as a function of redshift, right, we have about the two, and you want to try to discriminate um, trend lines, 
Or if you want to look at does the does the gas loss in this version look redshift, which I showed steadily marches up to redshift to the Fed turnover, tracking the star formation rate density, does it keep rising, tracking the, the merger rate, right? So these are really important things that you need to, to discriminate between your models. If you want to push here, I'm about to argue that you need, we need the resolution afforded by 20 to 40 meter class facilities. Or do you need play? But let's just focus on the 20 to 40 meter class facilities. So to illustrate that, um, this is that movie I showed you before. This is a single snapshot of that movie. This is the gas density. The snapshot is at redshift 30. So this thing is, is this, this galaxy is merging with this galaxy here. You see a lot of really interesting structure in the, in the, the surrounding this region. Uh, if we now plot the true <coughs> gas velocity of this map here, that's this truth. And now I degrade it to the resolution of the scene limited stuff that everyone is doing now. And I don't worry about sensitivity, I'm not. Or, or what I'm actually tracing. I'm just talking about resolution here. This is what that looks like, right? And so what it looks like to me is that this is a rotating disk in the sense that there's a blue component and there's a red component. And most people would try to draw a kinematic major axis somewhere here and measure a rotation curve. In reality, the, the, this is the velocity of the difference of the, the two merging galaxies. <clears throat> if you say, okay, but we have adaptive optics and we kind of improve the resolution here, um, you do see that the red and the blue component pop out. You can start telling that this is maybe a merger, right? But if you had a hypothetical 25 meter um, telescope um, with adaptive optics at, at uh, 20 milli arc second resolution, you can really start probing this velocity field in a meaningful way in the sense that you, you, you separate out these two galaxies, of course, but you, you also get this small scale velocity structure that is just nowhere near the, the capabilities. That and so you can start asking really interesting questions like what is the coherence of the rotational motions, the turbulence and, and winds? And you can ask these questions to really find detail. Um, and then you wanna ask your favorite theoretical model, is this enough, is this small enough to start discriminating star formation feedback models or drivers of the, the 60 kilometer per second turbulence that I was showing you? It's not really clear what is keeping these galaxies so disordered for so long. Um, so we can start discriminating the drivers of that, of that turbulence. Um, so that is part two. So now we're at part three. When we come back to this question, are disk galaxies in place in the early universe? And we're gonna to go to our second angle of attack here. The kinematics say that a small fraction of galaxies have disks. Let's see what the metallicity gradient said. Um, so this is using um, observations from the CLEAR survey, which is headed up here at the mm -hmm. um, Here is our 2018 um, team meeting at Cook's Branch. Um, and yeah, special thanks to the Mitchell family and Conservancy for allowing us to, to spend a few days there. Um, it's really nice. Um, uh, so what CLEAR, what CLEAR is, is it, it made use of the, the GRISM on Hubble to get a, a kind of high resolution Hubble resolution spectra at low velocity resolution. So, so if you want to do some things like kinematics, you can't do that with these spectra. They're too low velocity resolution. They're very high spatial resolution. They, they make use of the spatial resolution bubble. And so what the prism does is it takes every object, actually every everything in this field, this is a just a infrared um, image of a, a specific field, and it smears the spectrum of every single object in this field. Right? And that's really great because you get a spectrum of every single object in the field, but it's really not good because you get a spectrum of every single object in the field. And so what that means is you end up with a lot of overlapping spectra. It's very confusing very quickly. Um, but you could kind of use a, a trick, you could roll the telescope so that the next time you take an exposure, the direction of the dispersion 
you will not, so in this case, this is a nice figure from uh, Vince, who is a graduate student here, from his paper. So in this, in this orientation, you see that this galaxy and this galaxy are both in the dispersion direction, and you can't separate out their spectra here, they're, they're overlapping. Um, when you roll the telescope, all of a sudden there's a, there's a small difference, and you can actually see the, the spectrum of the second galaxy pop out here, the spectrum of the main galaxy here. And so we can roll the telescope and try to, try to get around these, these degeneracies. Um, and so what you can do with that is you could say, okay, I have a high resolution spectrum of this thing. I want to know what that spectrum looks like at the position of, say, H alpha. And you can get a Hubble resolution emission line maps of these galaxies. So most so all the processing of this of this data was carried out with Prism, which is a really great set of software. Um, so we get Hubble resolution emission line maps of Here's the direct image. Here's O2, H beta, which is usually very faint, right? It's just it's a very faint line. Um, O3 here, uh, H alpha, right? We get a suite of emission line maps. And so what we want to do, uh, let me actually come to this figure first. So one of the really re unique things about clear is that clear was nominally taken in the blue prism, which is the G102 prism here. And so if you only had the blue prism here, what I'm plotting is at what redshifts these lines, which are going to become very important, at what redshifts do those fall in the blue prism? Um, there are very small windows where you would get a, a set of lines that I'll show you are, are useful, um, a very small redshift window. But what, what we did was we, we said, OK, we have the blue prism. Has anyone ever taken an observation of this field with the red prism or the blue prism, which we could just add to our data? And what that gives you is it, and the answer is yes, that there are a lot of observations in the red prism. Um, what that gives you is overlapping regions are a lot, there's a lot more overlap. Right? So you get, a, you get uh, this, a, a, the suite of combinations of these lines over a larger redshift. All right, let me come back here. So what we want to do is convert these emission line maps. So here's a 2 h beta, 3 for one galaxy. We want to convert them to metallicity maps. So for each pixel, we fit a grid of photoionization models um, where we're fitting for two free parameters. One is the oxygen abundance, and one is the ionization parameter, uh, which is the number of ionizing photons per, per electron. Um, so we can convert these metallicity maps into, and if anyone is f familiar with this, we're using the mapping's four models and this Bayesian fitting tool, ICI. Um, so here are two examples of metallicity maps. One where we where, um, we favor that this thing has a metal-rich center and a metal-poor outskirt, right? So this is a declining metallicity gradient. More metals in the center, less metals in its outskirt. Here's one where it's more metal poor in its center, and it's more metal rich in its outskirts. So that's really interesting. Is that the, 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 everything I, I've talked about so far, this is like very disfavored by any sort of reasonable analysis of the model. Um, okay, and the reason that we could do this is because we have these suite of lines. All right, so we're all caught up. We have 218 galaxies with reliable metallicity gradient measurements <coughs> spanning a um, two decks in, in uh, solar masses. And these are all star forming galaxies on the main sequence. They're all kind of probing the, the typical star formation population. And so let me prime you for this plot. On the vertical axis is the oxygen abundance gradient. On the x-axis is the mass. The, um, down here is where we would expect disk galaxies to fall based on the arguments I made in the title slide, where they're more metal rich in their inner parts and less metal rich in their outer parts. Here is the kind of census of the literature um, ahead of this work. Um, so the, the high mass population was probed relatively well by the Camos 3D survey, which is um, April Woods, is the line here. Um, the low mass population, it, it, it's, it's unclear what was really going on. 
And so here are our points from clear. Um, and this is telling us something really interesting. 84% of these galaxies are consistent with flat. And I can move where these red points are on this plot depending on the fitting technique, but the, the general conclusions I'm about to make are, um, are relatively safe. 84% of these galaxies are consistent with being flat. So they're not down here where we would expect disks. Only 6% are consistent with having declining metallicity profiles. And 10% are rising. So these are, that's a really interesting population of, of things that doesn't really make sense. But 84% are consistent with flat. And so if we compare the, um, the points at redshift one and a half, so about 9 billion years ago, with um, those manga lines that I showed you at the beginning, at redshift zero today. As a function of mass, most of our things are flat. Um, redshift zero, uh, there's um, things become increasingly more declining as you increase with redshift. You only really start seeing flat things at very, very low masses, right? But for the most part, most things are have declining metallicity gradients, whereas we have flat metallicity gradients. So there needs to be some sort of evolution of this point to drop all the way down here, this point to drop all the way down here, this point to drop here, right? And so this has to do with, with um, this likely has to do with uh, that movie I was showing you, where you're allowing the natural course of things to, to take place, and the natural course of things is for galaxies to form metals more rapidly in their inner parts and less rapidly in their outer parts. Um, and so the fact that most of these are flat means that you're redistributing metals at a faster rate than you're allowing that natural course of things to, to take place, right? And so, I will circle back again to this question, are disk galaxies in place in the early universe? At redshift 2, 10 billion years ago and 3 billion years after the Big Bang, the kinematics say no. They say that random motions are providing a very large source of dynamical support, um, especially at low mass, but at all masses, less than 30% have a rotation, a ratio of rotation velocity to velocity dispersion that we expect for the least disky things today. So this is not expected for a population of disk galaxies. The Metallicity gradients are also disfavor, disfavor there being a large population of disks. We measure a very large fraction of flat metallicity gradients. Right? So that's not expected for a population of, this should say long-lived disk, I think. That would be me hedging the conclusion here. Long-lived disk. So both of these favor a disruptive mode of galaxy formation at early times, where you're halting the kind of that you're halting regular rotation and the formation of metallicity gradients that follow the star formation density profiles. Uh, and I will end it there. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Brad. Questions? Do you get any sort of metallicity measures for signal sample? So you're showing that like so one way to differentiate between merger and the 